Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we turn to Thee once more, and we come to offer our worship and our praise. We thank Thee, O Lord, that Thou hast given us the abundant assurance that we are ever accepted in the Beloved, and so we would render thanks and praise. Once more, O Lord, we come, conscious of our need, conscious of our frailty and inability, but thanking Thee for all that Thou hast provided for us, and especially in Thy Word. But we thank Thee likewise for all that has come down to us, for all that we've inherited, and has brought us into a large and into a wealthy place. And we thank Thee for all men Thou hast raised up in all previous centuries and ages and generations, and what we have by way of records concerning them, and how they fought the good fight of faith, and how they faced the problems of their day. We thank Thee, O Lord, that we are able to profit by all this, and we thank Thee for the provision Thou hast made for us. So we pray Thee now to enable us to use these things. Grant us that ability that Thy Spirit alone can give us to do so, we humbly pray Thee, in order that in all we do and are and say in the whole of our work and ministry, we may ever live to the praise of the glory of Thy grace. Hear us, O Lord, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. We now come to a kind of major division in this consideration of preaching, the preacher and preaching. We've uh, been looking at what takes place when uh, a man stands in a pulpit and preaches in a service in a church. We have to start with that. There is the fact. That is what is taking place. And we've considered, therefore, what preaching is in general and the preparation of this man who is doing this. But now we come to a different aspect of the matter, if you like. It's been general so far. We now come to the specific matter of how this man who is standing there and who is being called to do that and to whom the people come to listen, how does he actually prepare for this which he does week by week or oftener? You will see the kind of broad division that I've had in my mind. It seems to me essential that we should do this. We've got to be clear and right in our whole understanding before we come down to any particulars. But now I think we've reached that point. And so we come to look at this man, conscious of this call, preparing himself for the exercise of this ministry of preaching. How does he do so? What is his preparation? Well, I would lay it down as a first postulate that he is always preparing. And I mean that literally. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that he's always sitting at a desk. But he's always preparing, as it's true to say that there is no such thing as a holiday in the spiritual realm. I always feel that the preacher, the minister, uh, doesn't know a holiday in this sense. In those times of absence, from his actual work, he has vacations, but he never frees himself from this because of the nature and character of his calling. And everything that uh, he does or that happens to him, he finds to be relevant to this great work and is always a part of his preparation. Very well, but uh, bringing it down now to certain specific matters. The first and the most important thing that the preacher has got to do is to prepare himself, not his sermon. The most important preparation is the preparation of oneself. And I think any man who's been any length of time in the ministry would agree wholeheartedly with me concerning this. It's something that one has to learn, I think almost of necessity. At first, one tends to think that the great thing is to prepare the sermon. And the sermon, as I've been saying, does need most careful preparation. But this is much more important, the preparation 
of the preacher himself. In a sense, this preacher is a man of one thing. There are those who have said in the past, like John Wesley, that they'd become a man of one book. And while that is true, speaking generally, this is certainly true, that he is a man of one thing. This is the thing he is called to, and it's the great passion of his life. So what does he do about this? Well, the first great rule, I would say, again, is that he must be very careful to preserve a general discipline of his life. There are many dangers about the life of a minister or preacher. Uh, unlike men in professions and in business and so on, he is not tied uh, of necessity by office hours and things like that, or with the conditions determined outside himself. He is, as it were, his own master. I mean, I mean simply in reference to men. He is not his own master, of course, with reference to God. But there is this obvious division and distinction between the life of a minister and uh, the life of any other man. Things are in his own hands, in a way. And that is where he has to realize that there are some serious dangers and temptations which will confront him in a very special manner. One, of course, is the danger of just frittering away your time, particularly in the morning. You start with your newspaper, and you can spend a great deal of time on this, quite unconsciously and without desiring to do so. You just go on reading and reading. Then there may be some interruptions on the phone and so on, and you may well find that your morning is gone, whether you're doing your work in your home or in an office in your church. It doesn't make any difference. So I have felt always, and increasingly with the years, that one of the great rules... For a preacher is, safeguard your mornings. Safeguard your mornings. Make an absolute rule of this. Try to develop a system whereby you're not available on the telephone in the morning. Let somebody else take messages for you and tell, you the, and tell the people who are phoning that you're not available. Uh, one literally has to fight for one's life in this sense. Uh, how often has one had this sort of experience when I've been halfway through my work before I laid down this rule? Suddenly the telephone would go and uh, an excited minister would be on the phone. And, uh, well, I'd wonder what was happening. And he'd tell me that they'd had a deacon's or an elder's meeting the night before, that uh, the centenary of their church was coming in two years' time. So they thought the time had arrived to start making preparations for this, and they'd been considering it last night. Would I be prepared to preach at this uh, centenary service in two years' time? Well, you see, that's the sort of thing that happens. And, uh, well, you can do two things about it. One is uh, to ask him if it is as urgent as all that. Wouldn't a letter have done? And then the second and the more effective way is not to answer the telephone at all, <laughs> and to give instructions to somebody to say, well, would you mind phoning back at such and such a time, uh, lunchtime or some other time, when you've finished your morning's work. You've got to fight for the morning, and I would lay this down as an absolute. Don't let even the affairs of the church, let nothing interfere with this. Keep it out. You've got to give your morning to this great work of preparing for your work in the pulpit. Now, I want to add a word here, which to me is an important one. Whether you'll agree or not, I don't know. But I want to emphasize that every man must know himself. Nothing is more important than that a man should get to know himself. And when I mean that, I mean partly physically, as well as temperamentally, and in other respects. I'm saying this because there are many people who would prescribe a program for a preacher and a minister. They would give him rules and regulations. They would tell him when to get up in the morning and what to do before breakfast and what to do after it and so on. They, they don't hesitate to draw up systems and programs and to advocate these and recommend them and almost to suggest that if a man doesn't follow such a program, 
well, that he is a sinner and that he is that he is failing. Well, I've always been an opponent of this idea, and for this reason, that we are all different, and that you cannot lay down a program like this for everybody. Now, let me uh, illustrate what I mean. After all, we live in the body, and our bodies are different, and we've got different temperaments, and so on. You can't lay down universal rules. The illustration I would use is in the matter of uh, dietetics. A uh, lot of writing and discussion about what one should eat, what diet one should go on. And there have been people who have come forward and have uh, worked out and advocated a kind of universal diet. Everybody should be on this diet. And you go on to this diet and you'll never have any more troubles. Well, now, there's one very simple answer to all that. Uh, I've often put it like this, that the first rule of dietetics happens to be this. Jack Spratt could eat no fat. His wife could <laughs> eat no lean. Now, that's, a, that's just a fact. Jack Spratt was so constituted that he could eat no fat. He couldn't help it. Couldn't help it. He was born like that. This is a question of the metabolism of the body, which one doesn't determine. His wife was entirely different. Well, now, to prescribe a common diet for Jack Spratt and his wife is therefore just sheer nonsense. Very well. Take that to a higher level. This applies, I think, in many respects. Some of us are slow starters in the day. Others wake up fresh and full and brimful of energy in the morning, like a dog at the leash waiting to get to work. Now, you don't determine this. This is something constitutional. It depends on many factors, partly on blood pressure and many other factors. Your nervous constitution, all these things come in. And I, I therefore say that our first business is to get to know ourselves. Get to know how you work. Get to know when you're at your best. And so on. And then don't allow anybody to impose mechanical rules upon you, or to dictate to you how you handle yourself and handle your day. Work out your own program. You know when you can do your best work, and you must have found already, and if you haven't, you very soon will, that it's possible for you to sit at a desk according to the rules and regulations for a couple of hours with a book open in front of you and perhaps turn the pages, but absorb very little. And perhaps later on in the day, in half an hour, you could do much more than you tried to do in the two hours in the morning. That kind of thing is what I mean. Well, this means, in other words, you see, that it's thrown right back upon the man himself. Nobody can tell him what to do. But this is what controls everything. If he is as he should be, and as he must be if he's to be a true preacher, a spiritually minded man who is concerned about ministering to the glory of God and the edification and salvation of souls, he will do this. That is what compels him. If he's got the right motive and the right objective, well, then he'll be so anxious to do it and to do it in the most effective manner that he will trouble, take the trouble to find out how he can best order and organize himself and his day. Very well, to me that is a most important point, and I found it increasingly important. I've known many men get into difficulties because they've had a system imposed upon them which was not suited to them. Well, the next thing, of course, is this. And here one speaks with diffidence, hesitation, uh, and with a good deal of a sense of utter unworthiness. I suppose we all fail at this next point more than anywhere else. And this is in the whole matter of prayer. Prayer is vital to the life of the preacher. You read the biographies, the autobiographies of the greatest preachers throughout the centuries, and you'll find that this is always a great characteristic. They were always men of great prayer, and they spent considerable time in prayer. I could quote many to you, but I mustn't start doing that. There are so many of them. 
they found that this was absolutely essential to them and that it became increasingly so, not less so. Now, uh, I, I've always hesitated to deal with this matter. I, I've preached on the question of prayer when it's come in a passage which, through which I'm working or in a book or the Bible through which I'm working, but I've never presumed to produce a book on prayer. Again, you see, people do this in a very mechanical, mechanistic manner and can take you through different aspects and classify it all, and it all seems so simple. But prayer isn't like that. There is an element of discipline in prayer, of course, but um, it can, I feel it can't be dealt with like that because of its very nature. Uh, all that I would say is this, and I'm speaking here from personal experience, that uh, once more it is very important for one to know oneself in this matter. Uh, whether this is a sign of uh, a lack of <coughs> deep spirituality or not, I don't know. I don't think it tells, but uh, I would have to confess freely that I very often found it difficult to start praying in the morning. Uh, and uh, I've had to learn one or two things about this. You can't pray to order. You can get on your knees to order, but you can't pray to order. And I found it extremely valuable to learn how to get oneself into that frame and condition in which one can pray. You've got to start yourself off. And here, you see, this knowledge of yourself is so important. And uh, what I have generally found is this, that uh, to, to read something, uh, which can be in general characterized as devotional, is of value. Now, I don't mean something sentimental by devotional. I mean something with a true element of worship in it. Notice that I'm saying that you don't start yourself in prayer by reading the scriptures always because you'll have the same difficulty there. So you start by reading something that will warm your spirit, get rid of a coldness that may have developed in your spirit, and you've got to warm yourself, you've got to start yourself. It's comparable, if you like, to starting a car when it's cold and so on. You have to do various things. Well, you'll find you'll have to do this with yourself. And I have found it very valuable to do that, not to struggle vainly, but when one finds oneself in this condition and that it's difficult to pray, don't struggle in prayer for the time being, but read something of this character and you'll find that it'll bring you into, into a condition in which you can pray more freely. But now I'm not suggesting for a moment, quite the reverse, that your prayer should be confined only to the morning when you start your work in your study. Prayer is something that uh, should be going on throughout the day. Prayer is not of necessity to be long. It can be brief. Just an ejaculation at times uh, is a true prayer. And uh, I, I believe this is very important that one should uh, be continuing like this well, it, it surely is the interpretation of that exhortation in 1 Thessalonians 5. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing doesn't mean that you're perpetually on your knees, but that you're praying as you go along, uh, as you're walking along the road, or as you're working in your study. Uh, you turn to God in prayer. Uh, but, and this again I, I would emphasize very much, Always respond to every impulse to pray. The impulse to pray may come when you're reading or when you're battling with a text or something. I would make this an absolute law. Always obey it. Where does it come from? Well, I suggest it is the work of the Spirit. It, it's a, a part of the application of Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you, 
both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And this is one of the remarkable things one finds and one of the most blessed experiences in the life of the minister. A call to prayer. The impulse. Never resist that. Never postpone it. Never push it aside because you're busy. Give yourself to it. And you'll find that not only have you not been losing in the very matter with which you were, were dealing, but you, you're going to gain. You will have an ease and a facility in doing the very thing you've been trying to do, which is quite astonishing. So that it must never be regarded as a distraction. Always respond to it immediately. And thank God if it happens to you frequently. But the thing is that the minister, the preacher, is to be a man of prayer find this constantly emphasized in the pastoral epistles and elsewhere. And as I say, it's confirmed so abundantly in the long history of the church, and especially in the lives of the outstanding ministers. I think it was John Wesley who used to say that he thought very little of a man who didn't pray four hours every day. Well, think about that. Four hours every day. And we know something about David Brainerd and Jonathan Edwards and people like that. And that is why one is so humbled as one reads about men like that. Very well. I say no more. The next thing that obviously has to be considered is the reading of the Bible. This is obviously something that uh, the minister is doing every day and doing regularly. My main advice here would be Read your Bible systematically. The danger is that one reads at random and that one tends to be reading there for one's favorite passages or that, putting it negatively, that one fails to be reading the whole Bible. This is the thing I want to emphasize. The vital importance of reading the whole Bible. Um, I would say that the minister should read the whole Bible at least once every year. And in order to do that, there are many methods that you might devise for yourselves, or you might employ methods that have been devised by others. I remember I'd worked out a scheme in my early years in the ministry, and I felt it was fairly satisfactory, but then I came across the scheme that Robert Murray McChain that worked out for the members of his church. It's in his biography by Andrew Bonner. And according to this scheme of Robert Murray McChain, he has so planned it that you read four chapters of the Bible every day. And by doing this, you read the Old Testament once, but the Psalms and the New Testament twice each year. That's, that was the whole object of his scheme, to get his people to go right through the scriptures, everything, leaving nothing out at all, not picking out little sections like many of these modern schemes do, just picking out a few verses or small paragraphs and so on, and taking many years to go through the whole Bible and sometimes omitting certain passages altogether. Robert Murray McChain's scheme makes you read the whole Bible once a year, and as you're doing so, you will have read the Psalms and the New Testament twice during the course of that year. Now, this I, I have found of extreme value. It is one of the most important things of all. Then, having done that, you can decide to work your way through one particular book with uh, commentaries, or with any aids that you may choose to imply. You make now, the, the, the reading I've been describing so far has been general reading. But uh, now you, you are studying one particular portion, one of these chapters, if you like, in detail and carefully, uh, with all the aids that you can commend and your own knowledge of the languages and everything else as you go along. Now, here is a thing that needs to be emphasized very strongly. I have said that you're doing this generally. In other words, one of the most fatal 
habits that a preacher can ever fall into is to read his Bible in order to find texts. This, this is a real danger, something that has got to be recognized and fought and opposed as much as you can. Don't read the Bible to find texts for sermons. Read the Bible because it's the food for your soul that God has provided, because it is the Word of God, because it is the way to get to know God. Read it with that object and intention. Now then, but you're a preacher. Very well. Now then, here is the special word for the preacher. He doesn't read his Bible in order to find texts. But, as he is reading his Bible in this way that everybody else should read it, only more so, he will suddenly find as he is reading that a particular statement stands out, as it were, and hits him and speaks to him and immediately suggests a sermon to him. Now, here again, I want to say something that I would regard as, in my experience, one of the most important things a preacher can ever know. I had to discover it for myself. I've told others about it since, and they've been grateful to me. There are men I never meet them now, but that they thank me for having told them this. This is what I've told them. When you are reading your scripture in that way, I don't care, you may only have read a verse. If uh, the next verse stands out and hits you in this way, stop. Don't go on reading. Stop immediately. And listen to it. It's speaking to you, you speak to it. Stop at once. And work on this statement that has struck you in this way. And go on doing so to the point of making a skeleton of a sermon. You see, the thing has spoken to you. It has suggested a message to you. Very well. Now, you see, this is the thing that one used to, this was the fatal trouble. You'd say to yourself, ah, oh, yes, that's good. I remember that. And uh, then you go on with your reading, and uh, then uh, you find yourself perhaps towards the end of the week without a sermon, without a text. And you say, now, what was that that I was reading? Oh, yes, it was this verse the other day. Oh, and you turn it back to it. And it says nothing at all to you. You can't recapture what it was. That's why I say, when this happens to you, stop immediately. And not only work out your skeleton in your mind. Here's the real tip, if you like. Put it down on paper. Put it down on paper. Uh, I've, for many, many years, I've never read my Bible without having a pad either on my table or in my pocket. And when this kind of thing happens to me, I pull out my pad. You've got to be like a squirrel when you become a preacher. <laughs> and when the thing speaks to you like this, work it out, get your skeleton, put it down on paper, because you will not remember it otherwise. You'll think you will. You'll get the same experience as you had already and will have in, in your examinations. You know what it is to sit and listen to a lecture and to hear the lecturer saying things. You say, yes, that's all right. I know that. That's all right. You go to the examination hall. You have a question on that very matter. And you suddenly find you don't know much about it. You thought you did, but you don't. Put it down. And the result is this. That you will find that you will soon have accumulated a little pile of skeletons. Skeletons of sermons. <laughs> skeletons of sermons. In this way. And this is, this is a most wonderful thing. I've known ministers frantic on a Saturday. No texts, no sermons for Sunday. Trying to get hold of something. Well, it's because they didn't do this kind of thing. This, this is, I, I would say, one of the single most important things in a practical sense in the life of the preacher. So when you're reading, and this happens to you, stop at once and deal with it in this way and make sure that you've got it down on paper. Very well. There's your reading of the Scriptures. And you do this regularly, day by day. If you feel like doing more, do so. Be free in this matter. Don't even be too tied to any excellent scheme, such as I've mentioned. Allow yourself to be led in these matters, but I'm trying to give you a sort of general discipline for the day. What else does the 
preacher doing is this preparation of himself. Well, the next I would put down isn't, I can't think of a better term. I don't like the term in some ways because it's been so abused. I've put down devotional reading. Now, I don't like a devotional commentaries. I abominate devotional commentaries. I don't want people to do my devotions for me, and yet I can't think of a better term here. What I'm trying to say is this, that there is a type of reading which is going to help you in general to understand the scriptures and to prepare for the pulpit. It comes next to the scriptures. What sort of thing I mean? Well, I wouldn't hesitate myself to put under this category reading the Puritans, because that is what you get when you turn to them. These men were preachers, and they were practical, experimental preachers. They had this great pastoral interest and care. So as you read them, you find that they will give you knowledge and information, but they will at the same time do something to you. And uh, once more, I, I would say this, that it's most important that a man should know not only himself in general, but know his particular moods and states and conditions. Now, the preacher should never be moody, but though he should never be moody, he will have varying moods. Not one of you can tell me what you'll feel like tomorrow morning. You don't control that. You, what you do is to do something about it. You don't allow yourself to become a victim of it. But you're not the same two days running. And you have to treat yourself according to your varying conditions. And so you will have to discover what is the most appropriate reading for yourselves along these lines in these varying conditions. So you will find, I think, in general, that the Puritans are almost invariably helpful. I don't want to go into this, but there are Puritans and Puritans. Um, John Owen is a difficult man to read, and he was uh, a highly intellectual man. There, are Puritan, there were Puritan writers who were warmer and more direct and more experimental. I shall never cease to be grateful uh, to one of them called Richard Sibbs, who was balm to my soul at a period in my life when I was overworked and badly overtired, uh, and uh, therefore uh, subject uh, in an unusual manner to a kind of onslaught by the devil. Uh, now, in that kind of state and condition, to read theology doesn't help, and it may be well nigh impossible. You need some treatment for your soul. Well, I found at that time, that Richard Sibbs, who was known at, in London as the heavenly Dr. Sibbs, was balm to my soul. He has a book called The Bruised Reed, another called The Soul's Conflict. It's invaluable, and I do pity the minister who doesn't know the appropriate remedy to give himself in these various phases through which his spiritual life will pass. This may sound strange to some of you. You may have a theoretical outlook. You haven't been in the ministry. You haven't had the problems and the cares. The Apostle Paul knew what it was to have within, without were fightings, within were fears. He knew what it was to be cast down and in great conflict and a great fight going on. And any minister worth his salt is bound to know this. The care of all the churches, says the apostle elsewhere. And all these various factors, problems with people, problems with yourself, physical states and conditions, all these cause this kind of variation in the level of one's spiritual experience. It's been the testimony of the saints throughout the centuries. And I am always very distrustful of uh, any Christian who tells me that he or she knows nothing about variations. Uh, you know that chorus that puts it, and now I am happy all the day. I don't believe that. I don't believe it. It isn't true. You're not. There'll be times when you'll be unhappy. 
There are these states and conditions of the soul. And the sooner you learn how to deal with them and how to handle them, the better it will be for you. So I would add in under this uh, same heading again, the reading of uh, summons. Now I want to be careful about this. Uh, I've already indicated to you that there are also summons and summons and that uh, the date at which they were published is a little bit important. But once more, I'm simply telling you now as a fact of experience that um, the value and the help that I derived in my early years in the ministry from Jonathan Edwards is something which I shall never forget. But of course not only his sermons, but also uh, his account of that great uh, awakening, that great religious revival that took place there, and his book on the religious affections. All this is invaluable, because there was a man who was expert in dealing with the states and the conditions of the soul, and also dealing in a very practical manner with problems arising in, in a pastoral ministry, and in people, people who are having a very living and vivid, and sometimes even excitable, spiritual experience. This is invaluable to the preacher, so that reading along that line, I would put always second to the scriptures themselves, in the case of the minister. And so he will have to choose judiciously. But again, I would emphasize that he must learn to realize what is the appropriate medicament for him just at this point. It's not only important for him, but when he comes to advise others, it becomes equally important also, because you can make people much worse by giving them the wrong type of book to read. You see, if a man is already uh, slightly melancholic and tends to morbidity and introspection, if you give him a book to read that... Uh, is simply dealing with the pressure of conviction of sin. Well, you may drive him mad. He doesn't need that. He needs a healing balm at that point, and vice versa. You've got to know it for yourself. You've got to know it for others. Very well. I leave that whole section like that. There's ample material. There's no shortage in the matter of material. Indeed, the difficulty the preacher generally finds is to have enough time to read. It's a great battle. The next uh, group, therefore, that I would indicate would be this, is um, what I call now a more purely intellectual type of reading. And here are the things I'm going to say I think are obvious. The first is theology. You don't finish with theology when you leave a seminary. You go on reading theology as long as you're alive. You never stop. And the more you read, the better. Uh, there are different uh, authors, different systems, and so on. Go on reading your theology. I think this, nothing is more tragic than what happens to many a men, as it happens to people, of course, in other professions. They stop reading when they leave their training. They think they know it all. They've got it all. They've got their notes. They've got it taped, as they think, in that sense. Actually on tapes by now, but uh, uh, which is still worse. But <laughs> my, 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 point is, my point is that you go on reading it and read the big works, the bigger works. Uh, I've got many reasons for saying this. Uh, I'll give you them uh, at the end, but let's leave it at that for the time being. And then, of course, I come back again. I mentioned these things under your training before you're ever in the pulpit. What I'm saying now is that you go on doing it after you've been called and ordained and you're doing your work. Church history. Go on reading that. Never stop reading church history. And uh, again, perhaps I should have put it under the previous section. It might be more appropriate there even than here, but I've got it down here in my notes, I see. Uh, biographies, journals of men of God, especially these men who have been used as preachers, Whitfield, 
Wesley's and so on. Keep on. Keep on with this. It's never ending. And the more you do it, the better equipped you'll be. This is, you all remember, the preparation of yourself. Then uh, the next uh, group I would put down here would be a sort of apologetic reading. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean this. That there are uh, fashions in theology and so on. They come and go. You're familiar with all this. Well, it is the business of the preacher to be acquainted with all this. So he will have to read uh, some of these books. He can't read them all. There are too many of them. Far too many. But he, he will have to read some of them. And then uh, questions, say, in connection with science, where science seems to come into conflict with our faith and with the teaching of the scriptures, and so on. All these Matters come in, then, of course, psychology and so on, and these subtle attacks upon the faith that are coming from these various directions. Now, one man can't be expert on everything, but he's got to try to keep up as best he can. So it is his duty to be reading these matters so that he may know what is happening. And I'm talking now mainly in terms of books. Well, then, of course, in addition to that, there are certain journals and periodicals that it is his duty and his business to be reading regularly. Not only the journals and periodicals in his own denomination, but wider if he can and if he's got the time. This is in order that he may keep up to date in what is happening. As we've seen and we've emphasized this, he has got to make an assessment of the people who are going to come to listen to him. Well, therefore, he must know something about their background and their outlook and what they're thinking and so on. And therefore, it is important that he should be reading these religious journals and periodicals and so on to be aware of the various tendencies, because his people may be confused by all this. And, of course, today, in addition to all this, there is this ecumenical movement and the pressures that are coming from that direction. And people, in their innocence and their ignorance, are, listen to, are ready to listen to plausible speakers or uh, to taken the message of a plausible article, and we've got to help them and to protect them. We are shepherds, we are pastors, we are looking after these people who have been committed to our charge, and it is our business, therefore, to equip ourselves for doing so. Very well. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here before I go on to any other type of reading, and that is the all importance of maintaining a balance in your reading. I can't emphasize this too much. You see, again, we are all different. And there's a type of man who spends the whole of his time reading theology, or philosophy, or psychology, and reading practically nothing else. This, I think, is really dangerous. You must prescribe a balanced reading for yourself. What I mean is this. Read your theology, as I say, but always balance it, not only with church history, but with biographies and this more devotional type of reading. I'll tell you why this is so important. You're preparing yourself, remember. And the danger is to the intellectual type of men, if he's only reading theology or philosophy, he tends to become puffed up. He thinks he knows all about it, and he's got his perfect system. There's no problem, there's no difficulty. He'll soon discover that there are, and if he wants to avoid shipwreck, the best thing for him to do is when he feels that he knows all about it and is elated and tempted to intellectual pride, let him then pick up, say, the journals of George Whitfield and realize how that man was used of God here in Philadelphia and other places. And if he doesn't soon feel that he's a worm, well, then I would suggest that he's never been regenerated. You've got to humble yourself. That's why balanced reading is an absolute essential. If, if your heart isn't as engaged as your head, well, your theology is defective apart from anything else. But there is this danger, as we, I'm sure, are all ready to recognize of becoming over-theoretical, over-academic, over-objective. 
And it will mean that you are not only in a dangerous spiritual state yourself, to that extent you'll be a poorer preacher and a poorer pastor, and you won't help your people and you'll be failing at the task to which you're called. The way to counteract and to safeguard yourself against that is to balance your reading and never fail to do it. Never. I think a man should always be reading in the, along these differing lines daily. I've developed a sort of routine, uh, and I, I think it's uh, sound uh, almost from the physical standpoint as well as the other, that if I'm reading the stiffer and the more difficult books, or the more directly theological books and so on in the morning, I would read these others at night. It's good for your mind not to be too much exercised before you go to sleep and so on. And uh, you'll find this is all important. It doesn't matter so much when you're young. You can do almost anything you like and you'll still sleep. But as you get older, you'll find it's not quite so easy. And I've often, I've often have to tell men who've been in great trouble and on the verge of a breakdown, it was obvious from listening to their stories, that they were going to bed having read really difficult matter that was calling out all their reserves and mental ability, and then they're surprised that the mind doesn't stop working when they go to bed. This is sure common sense, but it's very important. So balance your reading for all these reasons. And then, another general principle is this. What is the purpose of all this reading? Well, I'm emphasizing that the object of all this reading is not primarily to get ideas for preaching. Now this is another terrible danger, as men tend to read their Bibles in order to get texts for sermons. So they tend to read books in order to get preaching material. It's amazing. They'll do this in any sense. I remember a man, a minister once telling me that he'd been to a conference of, uh, I think it was MRA, it doesn't matter what it was, but it was something along that line. Uh, and he uh, told me uh, how valuable the conference had been to him. And then I was expecting him to tell me about uh, something he'd experienced, or something that it had done to him. <coughs> that isn't what he told me at all. He said, I got wonderful preaching stuff. Preaching stuff. You see, he'd even go to a conference like that just to get material, illustrations, stories for sermons. This man had a sort of inured himself from any spiritual influence because he was always going with this idea. He'd read his Bible to get texts. He'd read books to get ideas. In fact, this can be quite ludicrous, and it's, I'm very glad that it can be for this reason, that preachers who have to go to books to get sermons are generally caught out. Uh, this uh, happened in my experience. Well, it, it, I believe it still happens. There was a, a famous uh, bookshop in a town in South Wales, and uh, the preachers from the outlying district used to go into the market uh, and so on once a week, and they'd all go to this bookshop and they'd buy the books. Of course, they were all buying the same books. And the result was they were all preaching the same sermons. <laughs> but unfortunately for them, you see, their uh, people, their church members, would know one another. And they'd have a talk and they're saying, how did things go last Sunday? And, oh, it's a wonderful sermon. Or, what was it? What was the text? And they'd say, and what was it about? And the other man would smile. He'd been hearing much the same thing. <laughs> Slight variations, of course, but uh, essentially the same sermon. In other words, these poor fellows had become dependent upon books for their ideas. I remember another minister who was quite a good preacher telling me on one occasion, I think I happened to go into the same compartment in the train as he was in, and there I found him reading Robert Bridges' Testament of Beauty. And he said, you know, I get much more from these fellows than I do from anybody else these days. What he meant was, he, he, he got more preaching material there, more sermons. And there are people who get their ideas from books and journals and all sorts of places. Now, I say this is not the function of reading. What is the main purpose and function of reading? Well, of course, it is to give you information, but still more important, it is because it is the best general stimulus. 
and what the preacher always needs is a stimulus. In a sense, you shouldn't go to books for ideas. The business of books is to make you think. We are not gramophone records. We are to think originally. It is to be our thought. And you don't merely transmit ideas. The, the preacher is not meant to be a mere channel through which water flows, as it were. He is to be more like a well. And the function of reading, therefore, is to stimulate us in general, to stimulate us to think, to think for ourselves. You, you take all this that you read and you masticate it, but you don't deliver it as you've got it. You deliver it in your own way, this peculiar something that has been given to you, as I was explaining in dealing with the, the sermon and so on. So I think it is very important to emphasize that general principle that that is, after all, the chief function of learning. It's tragic when men become mere gramophone records or tape recording machines, and the same thing is being churned out and repeated. The man will soon become barren, he'll soon be in difficulties, and his people will have recognized it long before he does. Very well. One other thing in connection with reading, general reading general reading. I think this is also important. Why? Well, if, it were no, if you had no other reason, if, uh, merely for the sake of relief for the mind, the mind needs rest. The man who is too tense and overdoing it is soon going to get into trouble. You can relieve your mind, but to relieve your mind doesn't just mean that you stop reading. Read something different. Read something quite different. The mind can relax. A change here is good. A change is as good as a rest in this respect. And at the same time, you'll be getting good general information, which will help you in your preaching. So I advocate the reading of history. I mean secular history now. I mean biographies. History of statesmen. History of wars, if you like. You may develop some special interest. If you've got one, well... Make use of it, develop it. Now, again, you've got to be warned. Don't give too much of your time to it. That's the danger. You'll always be fighting. There'll always be the tendency to go to extremes. But if you have a special interest, cultivate it. It'll be good for your mind. It'll preserve resilience, freshness, and so on. And therefore, I've always thought it's a good thing, and I've tried to do this, to take certain journals which uh, deal with things like literary matters and so on, where you'll get good articles and good book reviews, and they'll suggest to you other books to read, and so on. So, in other words, the minister is a man who's always reading, in a sense. Always reading. And he, he, he balances it, and he maps it out, for himself. Looking back, I, I, I've often said this. I used to make it a practice many years ago when on my vacation I always took at least one big book with me. And I generally at that time took the Bampton Lectures. These were often generally, in fact, by men who were not evangelical. But they were men who could take a broad survey, the very terms of the lectures, the Banton lectures or the Hibbert lectures or any of those. And I found this really valuable. They were generally big books, and uh, as a busy preacher, when uh, I hadn't got the time for consecutive writing, uh, reading, as one was doing one's regular work. So then I used to take advantage of the vacation, and I divided my day up like that. I, uh, my wife was very agreeable, and the children, I wanted the morning to myself, even on vacation, and I went for these big books. Then, having done that in the morning, well, then I was prepared to do anything the family wanted to do. But I do look back, and I'm grateful that I was given the sense and the wisdom to read along those lines. Let me finish one thing. Music. Music doesn't help everybody, but it helps some people. It happens to help me. A man asked me the other day, I don't think I told you this, he said he'd read recently in the obituary notices of Karl Barth, to his astonishment, that Karl Barth used to start the morning by putting on a record of music by Mozart. 
and he couldn't understand this. I said, what's your difficulty? Well, he said, a thinker like Bart, why does he, why does he go to, to Mozart? Why doesn't he uh, go to, to Beethoven or Wagner or somebody like that? Well, I, he was astonished. I said, my dear fellow, you evidently don't know the value of music, nor how to use it. I said, I can tell you why Karl Barth went to Mozart. He didn't go to Mozart for thoughts or ideas. He went to Mozart because Mozart did something to him, put him into a good mood. He wants to do his own thinking. Anything that puts you into the right mood for thinking is helpful. Isn't that the reason why the prophets of old were often started by music? Someone would play the harp or something else? There is this sort of release. I'll refer to this again. So anything that does you good, puts you into a good mood or condition, that pleases you, that releases you and relaxes you. Music, to some, does this in a wonderful way. Very well. Let the minister do that also. He's treating himself. He's preparing himself. Put on your gramophone record or whatever it is, anything you know that's going to help you. Very well. So I end as I started by saying this. Know yourself. <laughs> there will be special periods you'll find in your life. You'll, you'll have variations. You'll pass through phases and various states. Get to know yourself. And if you find, as you will find, that there will be periods, perhaps of days and weeks, when for some amazing reason your mind is working at its very best, and you're fecund and getting ideas for sermons and other things, well, hold out both hands. Take, in, take it all in as much as you can and put it down so that when the dry and the barren and the arid period may come, You've got something to fall back upon. Know yourself. Treat yourself. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.